All right, so welcome everyone to US History 1302. Me, Mr. Rackman, and our friends, Ayala, who played in the All right, listen. Today, we are going to be talking more and more about the Progressive Era. So, like we talked about yesterday, the Progressive Era was a period of time in American history roughly 1900 to 1920, when people tried to solve the major problems of the Gilded Age, okay? There were lots of different reform movements. Yesterday, we talked about just like a couple, like the movement to uh, regulate the food industry, okay? And we talked a lot about the women's suffrage movement. This is one of the major reforms of the Progressive Era, but it actually gets its start back in 1848. And I have had college professors Tell me, well, the woman suffrage movement goes back to you. Know, like, at some point, you have to hit like a starting point because you could go back to like Adam and Eve, you know, if you wanted to about when women fighting for the right to vote or whatever. Okay, we're not going to go back that far. 1848 is when the Seneca Falls uh, Convention was held, where a large group of women and men declared that women should have the right to vote, but then they almost immediately after the Civil War began having a conflict over should black women get the right to vote or should black men get the right to vote before white women. And this was a split in the women's suffrage movement that led to two different factions, the AWSA and the NWSA. We talked about them yesterday. The AWSA, they supported the 15th Amendment, which gave African-American men the right to vote before women. And they, were more moderate and they wanted to gradually lobby states to give women suffrage. So they started at like the local level, then the state level, and their idea was that they could slowly but surely build up the right for women to vote across the country, state by state by state. They were successful in Wyoming and Utah, but that was it until about 1890, okay? The NWSA was the more radical, more extreme version, and they're probably the more well-known, okay? Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony were the leaders of the NWSA, the National Women Suffrage Association, and they're super creative with the names. We got the national one and the American one. But anyways, uh, the National Women Suffrage Association, they were extreme. They pushed for a constitutional amendment they wanted woman suffrage for everyone in America, for all the women in America, all at the same time. Um, and they opposed the 15th Amendment. Some of them opposed the 15th Amendment because they didn't want black people to vote. Some of them opposed the 15th Amendment because they didn't think it was right for, you know, if you're going to expand the franchise to African American men, you should include women at the same time, you know, all or nothing. Okay. These were the ones that would do more high profile protests. They would like go and try to vote and get arrested. That's what Susan B. Anthony did. And right at the end of class yesterday, I was trying to tell you about how Donald Trump actually pardoned Susan B. Anthony for her crimes against the United States. See, technically, Susan B. Anthony was a criminal because she broke election laws trying to vote while being a woman. And President Trump forgave that, which is something the president can do. Unless you get impeached, the president can forgive anyone of any crime against America ever, okay? And it's not just people that are alive. You can pardon people that are dead. It happens all the time, okay? It's like for ways to... Re Basically, it's like America saying, we're sorry we were bad years and years ago or whatever. But moving on. Um, but these two suffrage groups, they both work to try to change people's hearts and minds about women having the right to vote. And we talked about that a lot yesterday. But one of the biggest problems was that they were fighting each other. And for people who are anti-woman suffrage, they could make the argument, why should we let women have the right to vote? They can't even agree on their own suffrage associations. These two different associations that both want women to have the right to vote are like actively butting heads. And so it didn't make their movement look very successful. Okay, But after 1890, things start to change. Okay. In the eight, right towards the, eight, the year 1890, Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell, the leaders of the American Women's Suffrage Association, died. Okay, Lucy and Henry were married, they're a married couple, and their daughter, Alice Stone Blackwell, 
she becomes the leader of the AWSA and she reaches out to the NWSA and they make, they apologize, you know, they let the bygones be got bygones, you know, they, uh, they put the past behind them and they propose a merger to have a united front, okay? And so the, the AWSA, the American Women's Suffrage Association, and the NWSA, the National Women's Suffrage Association, merge in 1890, and they come up with the best name ever, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, or NASA. Okay, that's the way you say the acronym, NASA. NASA combined, oh, uh, yes. NASA combined the um, tactics, resources, and individuals of both organizations. And after they combine, the movement grows in strength. They pressure state governments while at the same time fighting for a national constitutional amendment. And state by state, from 1890 to 1910, most of the states west of the Mississippi River give women the right to vote. The eastern states are more reluctant. And we'll discuss that in a moment, okay? But what really turns the tide for women's suffrage is World War I, okay? World War I happens for the United States from 1917 to 1918. And we've got a whole lesson about World War I. So, spoiler alert, we fight and we win, okay? While there are millions of men that have to join the military and go and fight in World War I, there are lots of jobs that need to be filled at home in factories. A lot of women take those jobs, and the women's suffrage movement strongly supports the women's suffrage movement strongly supports the um, strongly supports the, uh, the the World War One effort and all that stuff. And because of that support, they kind of proved to a lot of people like, "Hey, we worked just as hard to win this war as men did. We took jobs like men, and we worked in man's jobs, doing you know things like building airplanes and tanks and things." And through all that hard work and effort, that convinces a lot of the people on the fence about whether or not women should vote to support women suffrage. And the 19th Amendment gets ratified shortly after World War I on August 26, 1920. Okay, the 19th Amendment is the amendment that gives women the right to vote, that your right to vote does not depend upon your sex. This is a big deal. Okay, it expands the franchise to half the country overnight. Okay, you know, until 1920, half the country didn't have a voice in elections or the ability to vote. Okay, but this is probably one of the biggest changes in America during the progressive era. And the progressive era, it's all about moving society forward, fixing problems. The women's suffrage movement is not just about getting women the right to vote. It's also working to achieve equality and ending discrimination for women. But that fight continues on after 1920. But the big step is 1920s when we gave the right to vote with the 19th Amendment. Okay. This is a college class, but y'all are about to take a star test. Okay. You'll probably see the 19th Amendment on the star test somehow, or something like, what happened in 1920? They expanded the it's women's suffrage. 1920, 19th Amendment, when we get the right to vote. Okay. I want to remember that. All right, this is a map of states that had given women suffrage prior to the 19th Amendment. And then it has the, um, the years, I believe the years that they allowed women to have the right to vote. And it'll even show you like when, which ones would uh, ratify the women's rights um, or the 19th Amendment first. So if you'll notice, the green states, those are states that gave women full suffrage. And you'll see the years, like 1870, 1869, Wyoming and Utah were the first. And then there's a few in the 1890s. And there's a bunch in the 19 teens during the, the progressive era. They're getting more and more popular. And now these states that are light gray, those gave women the right to vote in presidential elections, but not state elections. Okay. 
And then the dark gray states, Texas and Arkansas, gave women the right to vote in primary elections, which for Texas was basically like getting the right to vote at all. Okay, today, Texas is heavily dominated by Republican politics, but in 1918, if you were a Republican vote running for anything in Texas, you were probably going to lose, okay? If you were a Democrat, you were probably going to win. Democrats controlled the South after the Civil War, you know, Republicans, they freed the slaves, that thing. Okay, Democrats controlled the South, and so in Texas and Arkansas, if you were the Democratic candidate for the governor, you're going to win. That's just like the way it works. So giving women the right to vote in the Democratic primary was almost the same as giving them the right to vote in the full election. Not entirely, but I mean, you know, effectively they got to vote and pick who would be in charge of Texas, okay? Now, you'll notice that the states that don't give women the right to vote, most of them are on the East Coast. And the states that give women the right to vote, the first ones to do so are in the West. Geography question. Why? Let's think about it. Let's see if y'all can figure this out. I kind of hinted at it, but I don't know if y'all figured it out yet. Why does the Western states support woman suffrage more than the Eastern states? Isn't it because they're not as populated? That's a big part of it. There's not as many people. What? Okay, so they need more women over there. They got to get people to come. Okay. Maybe by letting women vote, that'll like attract more settlers. Okay, over here on this map, I think I have a map that shows you the years that these places became states. Okay. So. Wyoming, oh, we can say anything, I think, but they're organized as a territory, 1868, 1868, Wyoming and Utah, 1868. A lot of these states become states in like the early 1890s, okay? All right, let's think about it. We put the pieces together. What do you think, Sandra? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is it easier to teach an old dog a new trick or a puppy a new trick? It's easier to potty train a puppy, right? Okay. The old states, the eastern states, Virginia, North Carolina, Massachusetts, they've been around since the 1600s for the most part, right? They were colonies, then they were the first states. Their state governments have been around since the beginning of the country, right? Okay, they have old established institutions with well entrenched political machines and politics. Okay, the people that run the politics, they are gonna be less willing to do a big radical change like let all the women vote all of a sudden. That is much, that could throw a lot of chaos in the system, right? Let's imagine that you're the leader of the political machine in the city of Boston, Massachusetts. You've got everything lined up. You know who your candidates are. You know who's running for this. You know who's running for that. Okay. You don't want to have to like start bribing a whole all the women to vote now too. You already got to bribe all the men. Okay. That could be an issue. Also, these old these eastern states are just older, more established, and it's harder to change. But the western states, they're brand new, and they need people, like you said. They need people to come and to live there and to establish the states. And it's a lot easier to give women the right to vote when you're just starting things off than it is to have a set up system and then change it. Does that make sense? You know, this is a brand new state of Wyoming. Okay, let's go ahead and give women the right to vote since we're at what we're already getting started anyways. You know, this, this is a big reason why the Western states in my opinion, are more open to this than the eastern states, okay? Because it kind of is weird because you have like the south and the north kind of agreeing on it, which is, you know, unusual in American history. So I think it's kind of interesting. It's a little geography, geography connection. All right. But in general, the progressives, they do lots of reforms, and we've got to go kind of fast. We're running behind. I don't have time to talk about every single little tiny 
different reform of the progressive era. Because like we talked about it yesterday, it's like a stained glass window. There's lots and lots of tiny, beautiful pieces of glass that make one big, beautiful stained glass window. There's lots of tiny reforms that make America a better place. But when you put them all together, you have the progressive era where all this stuff is happening all at once, okay? So there's lots of reforms in the government. There's reforms in the area of health. There are people that work to reform hospitals to like improve the safety standards and improve the standards of medicine. You start to see during this time period licensing happen, okay? Back in the day, back in the early 1800s, to be a doctor, you just kind of had to say, I'm a doctor. And if you did a good job doing doctor things, then people would keep going back to you. But if you know you didn't, then there wasn't like license to be a doctor. Does that make sense? There would be people who would go to universities and learn how to be a doctor at a university, then they'd display their medical diploma. And that would tell people that, hey, this is a doctor, but you know, there wasn't as much standardization of what it takes to be a doctor, okay? The progressive era, you start to see things like medical, medical exams that people have to take to prove that they can practice medicine. And today, that's like unthinkable to go to a doctor that's like, I just kind of feel like I'm a doctor. I bet I'd be a pretty good doctor. You know, back in the day, the way you could do things is you could like, go apprentice to a doctor and just like work for a doctor for many, many years. And then eventually be like, okay, I learned enough. Now I'm a doctor. Okay. But during the progressive era, you see more and more licensing. The same sort of thing happens with lawyers. Okay. Used to be, you could just kind of be like, I'm a lawyer now. And, uh, you know, if you're good at it then and you win cases, then people are going to keep hiring on you. And I mean, the way it would work is that if you were a crappy lawyer, no one would, you know, hire you and so you wouldn't get a lot of work but if you're a good lawyer you know there you go and so what you would do if you want to be a lawyer is you go work for an older lawyer and like be their clerk for you know years and years and years and then after you apprentice for a while then you're like you know what all right i know enough i'm going to be a lawyer now we have like exams the bar exam that people have to take to be a lawyer the same for like accountants and dentists and lots of professions become more professional and that is not something that's really done by the government at first. It's done by individual people voluntarily. They say, we're going to form an association of doctors, the American Medical Association. And anyone who goes to a doctor and sees the AMA certificate knows that this doctor is a good doctor. And if you go to the doctor's office and they don't have the AMA certificate, then don't go to them because they're not a doctor. Okay, so this, now the government is like involved and they like put their stamp of approval behind it. But it happened kind of on its own without the government really telling people what to do as people tried to more professionalize different industries, okay? One big reform of the progressive era is temperance. We talked about this before. Temperance is the effort to reduce the consumption of alcohol, to control the consumption of alcohol in the United States. And the temperance movement gets its biggest and most powerful wave of support during the progressive era. We talked about how the progressives, a lot of them tended to be Protestants. A lot of Protestant Christians organized to work against drinking. The Anti-Saloon League, the Women's Christians Temperance Union, and other organizations made public campaigns about the dangers of liquor and alcohol, okay? The alcohol consumption levels of the progressive of before, before prohibition were like just ridiculous. Okay. People drink alcohol constantly. And the level of, you know, like you could look up the specific gallons or whatever, but it was significantly higher than it is even today back then. And it's just like normal people, okay? They just, you know, you would go to lunch and you know, on your day at the factory, you go to lunch and you go to a bar. And, you know, they'd offer you, like, free soup if you buy a drink. And so, you know, people would go to the bar and, you know, buy whiskey and, you know, knock back two or three and then go back to work after, after lunch. And it was a big problem. But it wasn't just, just the drinking in general, but the consequences of drinking, okay? Alcohol will do bad things to you, okay? All right? First off, it's very, very expensive, okay? 
families across the United States wasted huge chunks of their paychecks on alcohol. And when we talk about how there were bad working conditions and low wages in the first place, and then these families, what meager savings they have, a lot of times that would just go away with the bottle every payday with, you know, men going to the bar and drinking away their paycheck. And then they go back home and they're drunk and they beat their wife and their kids and their kids are starving and they're, you know, they don't have nice clothes, but the man had plenty of alcohol. Okay. Alcohol leads to alcoholic abuse, alcoholism, addiction to alcohol, which is a terrible condition that people get. And people who are alcoholics, like it's a disease. It's something that like you can't just be like, okay, I'm not gonna drink anymore. Right. For a lot of people that take a drink, the drink takes them. And then they go back home and they have all sorts of problems, you know. They have health problems, their liver can deteriorate, you know, they can get alcohol poisoning, or they can just go home and you know, be abusive and hurt their wife and kids. And the people that were really, really for temperance, a lot of them were women. Because they suffered the effects of alcohol abuse. They suffered the effects of the saloon, you know, the men go and carouse and then the women suffer and the kids suffer and things just get bad. And finally, for you teenagers, alcohol makes you fat, okay? Beer is bread in a bottle. That's what it is, okay? You just ate like three loaves of bread a day. Don't you be surprised when you get fat. But then when people drink a six packs of beer a day, it's like, well, you get fat, okay? It'll happen to you, okay? Young men, young ladies, this is what happens when you drink alcohol. You get fat, okay? It's fat for you, okay? It's just like, it's like it's bread. It's like mushy, rotten bread that people drink and listen to. Anyways, so, it's bad. And so, usually that's like the most effective way to be like, don't drink alcohol. It'll make you fat, okay? All right? But it does a lot of bad things. Okay, and so across America, there's a wave of anti-alcohol sentiment and it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And it actually succeeds in passing a constitutional amendment, the 18th Amendment. Before we gave women the right to vote, we got rid of alcohol. But these two things are actually related, okay? Because a large number of the people who wanted prohibition the elimination of alcohol, the sale, transport, and manufacture of alcohol in America were women who believed that alcohol was a major social issue hurting the women of the United States, okay? Prohibition lasted from around 1919, I believe, to 1933 or 34, okay? The year's not super specific, but it lasted for about 15 years, and it was eventually a failure. Okay, because there was widespread disobedience. Basically, everyone tried to break the law. It created a whole new class of criminals. It, it greatly expanded like our jail system and our police force to like enforce a law that lots of people felt was unpopular. And it led to the growth of like organized crime, mobsters, and all sorts of problems. And eventually, during the Great Depression, it became a political issue to just get rid of prohibition. And so prohibition was out, was removed by the 21st Amendment. The Prohibition Amendment, the 18th Amendment, is the only one that has been repealed. Because the only way you can get rid of a constitutional amendment is with another constitutional amendment. And by the way, constitutional amendments are hard. To get a constitutional amendment passed, you have to have two-thirds of both houses of Congress. That's difficult to do. Today, we have a Congress that is... 50 Democratic senators and 50 Republican senators, and we have a Democratic vice president, and then we have a, a House of Representatives where there's like seven more Democrats than the Republicans. So the Democrats actually control all three houses of all the, the both houses of the legislature and the president, but they struggle to pass any laws. The same thing happened in 2016 when Donald Trump had Republicans control of the House of Representatives and the Senate and the presidency, it was still hard to pass laws because even a minority in a in Congress can do a lot of things to disrupt or to slow things down. The Democrats did it to the Republicans, the Republicans do it to the Democrats. They're all bad, okay? But anyways, actually getting two thirds of Congress to agree on something means that you have to get Republicans and Democrats to agree, typically. So constitutional amendments are hard to do. 
But that speaks to the power of the progressive era that women got the right to vote and the alcohol was made illegal. That's how politically powerful the progressives can, became in the end, at, right at the end of the progressive era. But that's not enough. You can't just have two thirds of Congress. Then you go to step two and you have to have three quarters of the state legislatures have to vote to ratify the amendment. So you have to get, today you have to get 38 out of the 50 states. So if 13 states say no, you can't have the amendment. So you can have an amendment that gets 100% support in Congress and 37 states say yes. And the 13 states say no, you're done. Okay, you can't have it. So it's hard, but the 18th amendment was passed and then it was repealed. So that tells you how much it flipped, okay? Now, the 18th amendment and the 21st amendment, it's easy to remember. Let me explain. When you are 18 years old, you're old enough to vote because you are not old enough to drink alcohol. The 18th amendment made it illegal to drink alcohol or well, it made it illegal to transport, sell and make. How old do you have to be to be able to drink in America? 21. What amendment <laughs> made prohibition gone? What amendment gave people alcohol back? The 21st amendment. I don't think they planned it out that way, but it's convenient. Okay, so that's a little memory truth that you can have in your brain. Okay, the progressives also worked for better safety in the workplace. They tried to reform education. They tried to reform city government. Okay, and what happens with city government is you start to see a lot of pushback against the political machines. One of the big, big weapons that got rid of political machines was secret ballot. Okay, because Whenever someone does not have the ability to hide who they are when they vote, you can intimidate them. Does that make sense? Okay. You can bribe someone to take this piece of paper that's public and put it in that box that is public. But when you go into a booth and you make the decision by yourself, it doesn't matter if they give you a turkey. It doesn't matter if they threaten to kill your family. You can say, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll vote for so-and-so, and then go in the booth and vote the other way, and no one will know, okay? Now, today, we live in a time where we're moving towards vote by mail, and that, to me, has the potential of eliminating the secret ballot, because, I, you know, that's one of those things that kind of touch you, but secret ballot is really super important in order to have a fair and free election, Okay because otherwise it's much easier to intimidate. It's much easier to manipulate the votes if it's not a secret ballot. So in the progressive era, secret ballots became more and more, more popular. Okay, also you start to see the Civil Service Commission become more and more important, okay? That really happened before the progressive era. Okay, if you remember James Garfield, we talked about him a few weeks ago. He was president, he was shot by someone who wanted a government job and didn't get it. Chester Arthur, when he took over, he worked to eliminate the spoil system by creating the Civil Service Commission, and it continues to work in the progressive era to make sure that people who get government jobs are hired based off of their skills and not because of their political connections, okay? There's reform movements to try to help people in poverty. There's reform movements to help increase public safety, like improving the sewer and water and electricity. We talked about like building buildings with building codes and fire escapes and things like that. All these things are important reforms of the progressive era, okay? There's also political reforms, okay? Before the progressive era, in a political primary, typically the party leaders would pick the candidates for state and local officers. So you would get to vote in like the general election, but the primaries, they weren't even a thing. But after the progressive era, you start to see more and more places, states and local governments allow the individual voters to select their party's candidates, okay? Before the progressive era, only members of Congress and state legislatures could introduce bills. But during the progressive era, many states created ways for voters to start the process of making a law, like creating a law and giving it to the Congress to vote on it. This is not something on the national level. A lot of these reforms happen on the state level. And that's one important thing to keep in mind. Some states were more progressive than others. Some cities were more progressive than others. So when I list off this list, 
it's not like everywhere all the time, okay? It's not even like it is that way with the national legislature, but some states have this, okay? For example, Texas uses referendums. You see, typically only legislatures get to vote on laws, whether or not they pass or fail. But many states like Texas and California and other states can put propositions on the ballot when there's an election and voters, not only are they picking who they want for the governor and the senator and et cetera, but they also get to pick whether or not they approve a law, okay? Texas uses referendum to pass constitutional amendments. The Texas constitution is much different than the American constitution. America's constitution is very short and it's very vague. That way it can apply to a lot of different situations. The Texas Constitution is super specific and super long. And in Texas, it's actually sometimes easier to amend the Constitution than to just pass a regular law, okay? So when you turn 18 next year and you go to vote and say the 2022 election, you will probably see um, constitutional amendments on the ballot for Texas in the November elections in 2022, okay? That's something that Texas does where they can actually change the constitution by proposing an amendment, putting it out to people, they vote yes or they vote no, and if it passes, it's added to the constitution. So Texas has like thousands of amendments. I'm pretty sure we're in the thousands now. I may be wrong, but like it should be around thousands of amendments. So there's tons of amendments to the US constitution. But what this does is it makes the government more responsive to the people. It makes it more democratic, okay? Before the progressive era, only courts or legislatures could remove corrupt officials. Today, in many states, there are recall elections where voters can sign a petition to start a recall election and vote to remove a governor or a senator or, what, or a legislature that has done something wrong or is corrupt. Currently, the governor of California is facing a campaign of a recall election. I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but they're trying to recall him because of some of the shady stuff he did during the coronavirus lockdown, like where he said, nobody can go outside, but I'm gonna have my own private party at my house with lots of people in no masks. Let's call it hypocrisy, okay? So anyway, but he's facing like, I don't think they're gonna get rid of him, uh, but there are some people in California that are trying to like recall him. So that's going on right now. That's something that we got during the progressive era. Not every state has this the same way. I don't think Texas really has recall elections. We do referendums all the time, though. Okay. It kind of depends on what state you're in. Probably the most progressive state was Wisconsin. They were like doing all kinds of crazy stuff. But all right. Now, the progressive era before 1900 is more a loose collection of people trying to change things. But in 1901, the progressive era gets their champion. President William or McKinley's vice president, Teddy Roosevelt. Let's talk about my boy William McKinley, okay? Mr. McKinley, 25th president of the United States. We talked about him a few weeks ago in our lesson about the populist party, okay? The populists were the party of the farmers, and they teamed up with the Democrats in 1896 to run for president with William Jennings Bryan. William Jennings Bryan lost to William McKinley because William McKinley represented urban interests in America, and there were a lot more urban people in 1896 than there were before, okay? And they, that was like the turning point right around 1890, more people in the city than in the country. Uh, but anyways, William McKinley was a very pro-imperialism president. William McKinley is the president during the Spanish-American War, okay, when we got Puerto Rico and the Philippines, and he's also the president whenever we annex Hawaii, 1898. During that Spanish-American War, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Teddy Roosevelt, who had, throughout his life, he had been the governor of New York, he had been all sorts of different things, he had went and fought in the Spanish-American War with the Rough Riders, right? Okay? He's a rising star. Teddy Roosevelt, we'll talk about a little bit. Teddy Roosevelt, when he was a kid, he was an asthmatic kid. He was little and shrimpy, and he decided he was tired of it. He started working out. He started pushing himself, 
and he became a big, tough, burly man, okay? He was actually like, you know, he was like a prize fighting boxer, okay? He was a rancher out in the Dakotas. He graduated from Harvard. He wrote dozens of books. He became a police commissioner for New York City. Later on, he was the governor of New York. I believe he'd been the mayor of New York City. He ended up becoming the president, but he was also a cavalry commander in the Spanish-American War. Teddy Roosevelt, he's basically the go-getter, can-do guy. When he was president, he was super, super, he just had so much energy. He had a zeal for life and like relentless energy, okay? He was just like a bull, like a bull in a china shop. He would just blast through any obstacle that came his way, okay? Teddy Roosevelt, if he comes against the problem, he's going to have to deal with it a certain way, okay? So now, traditionally, whenever you encounter a problem, the traditional step to dealing with the problem is you analyze the problem, you think about the solution, you then make a decision, do the solution, and then move on. You get through the problem. Maybe sometimes you just ignore the problem. Maybe you're scared and the problem makes you run away. Maybe you just kind of like go around the problem. You just ignore the problem and move on with your life. That's not how Teddy Roosevelt does things. If there's a problem, ah! you gotta get through it. Nothing is going to stop me, okay? This chair is a problem, out of the way, okay? We're gonna go on. No problem, we are going to just dance around. We're gonna overcome them. He's like the Kool-Aid man that blasts through the wall, okay? Oh yeah, that's, that's like Teddy Roosevelt, okay? If there is a problem, he is not going to just like be afraid, okay? They called him the Rough Rider, the Trust Buster. Okay, he was famous for a saying called <laughs> speak softly but carry a big stick. Okay, right? If you can do it the nice way, that's great. If not, we got a big stick. Okay, we're ready to fight. He was willing to fight. Okay, he's a prize fighter. He goes into the boxing ring, he takes a hit on the face, and he punches right back. Okay, that's Teddy Roosevelt. In 1900, the Republican Party is kind of freaking out. Okay. They're like, this guy, Teddy Roosevelt, he's becoming super popular. We don't want him to be president. He's a little crazy. So they decide to make him the vice president. Now you might be saying, why would you do that? Well, traditionally, at that point of time, the vice president was a dead end position. Usually people who became the vice president, that was like the end of their political career. They were stuck in the White House for four years, but they couldn't do anything because the vice president, you know, just sits around and waits for the president to die. That's their job. They do other stuff, but that's their main job, okay? So Teddy Roosevelt was making waves because he was a progressive. He believed that the government needed to work to actively fight against social problems and change things for the better. For many people in the Republican Party that were more conservative, they didn't like that. So they're like, let's make him be vice president. He can hang out in the White House for four years, and then maybe he'll move on and do something else. But then, so that was their plan. 1900, William McKinley runs for president. He wins re-election. He's super popular because, you know, he got his Hawaii and all that other stuff. But then William McKinley goes to the Chicago World, uh, not Chicago World's Fair. It's some, I think it is Chicago World's Fair. There's a World's Fair going on. There's an exhibition. And President William McKinley goes to a meet and greet, handshake sort of thing where people come to shake their hands with the president. There's a guy named Leon Schausgolz, and I'm pretty sure I mispronounced his name because it's like C-O-L-G-O-S-Z, whatever. It's like Polish, I think. Anyways, he was an anarchist. He hated the government. He hated the control of the government and industries over people. He wanted, you know, to destroy the government. That's like an anarchist, right? Leon Schausgolz takes a pistol, bandages his hand, and makes it look like his hand is broken, Okay. And inside the cast, he has a pistol, okay? Leon Chosgold waits in line to shake hands with President William McKinley. And, you know, there's, like, security. They're checking people for guns. But they don't think about a cast. So this guy comes, Leon Chosgold comes up to President William McKinley, and he's got his right hand bandaged. So William McKinley reaches to shake his hand with his left hand, and then Leon Chosgold holds it up, and he shoots him through the through the cast, kills William McKinley, dead. 
And now Teddy Roosevelt is president. Okay, so the Republican Party's plan to keep Teddy Roosevelt from being president actually made him president. Okay, and so Teddy Roosevelt becomes president, and he is that relentless, just super enthusiastic. He got his money's worth out of every moment, every minute of his life. Okay, he was our youngest president whenever he became president. I think he actually still is the youngest president we've ever had. I'm not sure. I think he's younger than Obama. But Teddy Roosevelt was one of our youngest presidents, but in his time before he was president, again, like he graduated from Harvard, okay, one of the toughest schools in America. He had been a cattle rancher. He had been in charge of the police department he had, in New York City. Okay? He had been like the governor of New York, the assistant secretary of the Navy, and he had been a colonel in the Spanish-American War in charge of San Juan Hill and fought in combat, okay? He was a super productive person. There are stories of foreign ambassadors coming to America to like visit the capital and talk to, you know, the president. I think this was the French ambassador. I may be wrong, but there was one ambassador who like visited with Teddy Roosevelt and they were like at the capital and they needed to go to the White House. Okay. And so in Washington, D.C., like the White House and the Capitol are on like different sides of the National Mall. Okay. And so Normally, you would think, okay, well, we got to go. Let's like get a car, let's get a carriage, or whatever. No, Teddy Roosevelt was like, let's get some exercise. Come on, let's walk. Okay. And so, like, you know, Teddy Roosevelt just like just barrels through. Like, Teddy Roosevelt didn't like stop and smell the roses. Okay. He was not the type of person that would, you know, think about things as he walked. When he walks somewhere, he walks somewhere. Okay. All right. You know, he like, if there's like a tree limb in the way, he's just going to like jump over. Okay. He's just going to blast through. He's not going to like slow down. And so like the foreign ambassador is like, oh, what's going on? You know, I can't keep up, keep up because, you know, they were an ambassador. They're used to like, you know, the limousines. Okay. Teddy Roosevelt is kind of like, he's on edge. He's higher. He's high energy, high energy kind of guy. But that's exactly what America needed during the progressive era because America had been dominated in the Gilded Age by these very powerful corporations that had lots of money, had lots of influence, and most importantly, they had a lot of government in their back pocket, okay? Their money, their wealth, their influence had put a lot of people in Congress. And so there are a lot of people in Congress that are basically not representing, say, the state of North Carolina, but rather representing J.D. Rockefeller, okay? Not a dog on North Carolina, just picked a random state, okay? But Teddy Roosevelt, when he becomes president, he proposes something called the square deal. He wants to provide Americans a square deal. Now, square refers to right and proper, okay? Not like, I want everybody to have cubes, okay? That, it's still a way of saying things, but you can say like, are we square? Like, are we okay? Or if you ever build a house, you want to make sure that all your angles are square. They're right. You ever seen like a square in carpentry? Okay, wood shop, a little, it's a triangle, but they call it a square. Okay, you use that to make sure everything's proper and right. And Teddy Roosevelt wanted the U.S. government to treat people proper and right, not to favor big business over the little guy, okay? And so Teddy Roosevelt very quickly earned a reputation of being a fighter for the American people. And what he did right from the get-go was he took on the monopolies and trusts in America, okay? No president before Teddy Roosevelt had actually had the guts to do anything about monopolies and trusts. Back in the 1880s, in 1886, I believe, they passed a law called the Sherman Antitrust Act a law that actually made it illegal to have monopolies, but nothing happened. You see, you can write on a piece of paper, monopolies are illegal, but until someone has the guts to actually go after the monopoly and force them to break up into smaller companies, nothing's gonna change, okay? Teddy Roosevelt was the first one to actually say, you know what, I actually have the power to break up monopolies according to the Sermon Antitrust Act. So I'm gonna do it. Now, if you were gonna like take on monopolies, you might think, okay, well, let's start out with like a small one and practice and then make our way up to the big ones. That's not how Teddy Roosevelt does things, okay? All right, Teddy Roosevelt ain't about that, okay? Like, say you go to prison, don't go to prison. But if you go to prison, 
okay, you know, a strategy that you could think about to survive is to find the biggest and toughest guy in prison and just punch him in the face and take him out on day one and say, I'm in charge now, okay? That's like Teddy Roosevelt's strategy. So from the get-go, he doesn't start off with like little tiny monopolies. He takes on some of the biggest and most powerful monopolies right from the get-go, like J.D. Rockefeller, like the Northern Securities Railroad Company of J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan's Northern Securities Railroad Company is one of the biggest monopolies of all time. Okay, and that's like the very first one that he takes on. Okay, he takes them on, he sues them in court, uses the Sermon Antitrust Act, he uses the power of the government that they've had the whole time, but everyone was too scared to actually do it, and he breaks up monopolies. And he starts busting up the trust in America that he considers to be a threat to the American people. Now, Teddy Roosevelt would distinguish between ones that he thought were a threat and ones that were not, but he's the first one to do it. He actually breaks through and says, look here, we're going to get rid of these monopolies and trusts that are hurting the American people. And it took someone, like again, like I kind of described Teddy Roosevelt, he's kind of like nuts, okay? One time he got shot during a speech, and he finished the speech, and then he went to the doctor, okay? He's just like nuts. But he's the type of person we needed to take on the monopolies and trusts, okay? All right, let's pick up there on Monday. You guys have a good day. Do good things. Be good people. Make good choices. We'll see y'all.